The fossil record allows us to see deep into the past life on our planet, enabling paleontologists to build up a picture of what Earth was once like and how all kinds of organisms have evolved over time. But this record is far from complete, and surprising discoveries are sometimes made that seem to transform our overall understanding of how certain lineages existed through time. One particularly interesting example of a surprising fossil discovery being made and seeming to change a significant aspect of what we thought we knew about a group of animals concerns a discovery made in Australia of something called a dicynodont. Dicynodonts were a grouping of animals that are members of the synapsids, the large overall group that includes us mammals as well as some of our extinct relatives. The dicynodonts were one such lineage of these relatives and were a pretty strange bunch. These herbivorous quadrupedal animals were very successful during the Permian and Triassic periods, before the dinosaurs truly rose to dominance during the Late Triassic, and include species such as Placerius, perhaps the most well-known dicynodont thanks to its inclusion in the first Walking with Dinosaurs episode, as well as the iconic Lystrosaurus, the legendary survivor of the great dying mass extinction that became incredibly abundant in the early Triassic world. Many of these dicynodonts reduced their teeth significantly, with a completely edentulous beak that would have been covered in keratin at the front of the mouth, and a pair of large tusks jutting from the upper jaw. Interestingly, dicynodonts are the only group of animals that aren't mammals to have ever evolved true tusks, and a recent study from 2021 investigated the implications of this, finding that this convergent evolution could occur because dicynodonts, like actual mammals, had very reduced tooth replacement patterns as well as a constant soft tissue attachment for these structures. Dicynodonts could also get pretty huge, too. There's a species that lived during the very latest Triassic period, Lysovicia bojani, that was named in 2019 from bones found in Poland, and it managed to grow pretty much to the size of an elephant, showing that these creatures were spectacular animals, getting to massive dimensions even in a world ruled by dinosaurs. Then, sadly, the Dicynodonts went extinct at the end of the Triassic period. Or did they? What if, in the murky depths of the fossil record, someone found evidence of these animals surviving for much, much longer than we thought? Well, that's exactly what was claimed in 2003, when Australian paleontologists published a paper entitled The Last Dicynodont, an Australian Cretaceous Relict. In this publication, the paleontologists presented six fragments of fossilised bone that had first been collected nearly 90 years previously, in 1914 at a locality in north-central Queensland that exposed some early Cretaceous-aged rocks. These remains were donated in 1915 to the Queensland Museum in Brisbane, on behalf of the man who had found them on his property and were actually put on display during a meeting of the Royal Society of Queensland that same year. It was here that the first suggestion of what these fossils might represent was made, when the assistant director of the Queensland Museum said that the remains looked a lot like dicynodonts known from South Africa except that these Australian remains seem to be from the Cretaceous period, almost 100 million years later than the next youngest known dicynodont. Strangely, the fossils remained undescribed until 2003, when the paper officially proposing this idea was published. The authors suggested that the dicynodonts had in fact made it past the end of the Triassic period, all the way through the Jurassic, and into the early Cretaceous, at least in Australia, more than doubling the length of time that dicynodonts were thought to have existed for. This was quite an extraordinary claim, implying that a major ghost lineage of dicynodonts, a so-called Lazarus lineage, existed throughout much of the Mesozoic from which we have no record of these animals. So what were these fossils that supported such a claim? Well, the best of the fossil bone fragments was interpreted as a piece of a maxilla, an upper jawbone, that included what was considered by the paleontologists to be the base of a tusk. Various anatomical features of this bone and bit of apparent tusk do indeed look a lot like what we see in dicynodonts, and the other fragments, considered to be from the nasal, orbital rim, and zygomatic arch of the skull, were also argued to show characteristic dicynodont features. The maxilla also preserved a fragment of another small tooth, called a postcanine tooth, which is an unusual but not unheard of feature in dicynodonts. The paleontologists were certain that these bones had come from early Cretaceous-aged rocks, and therefore argued that the only tusked animal it could have come from would have been some kind of late surviving dicynodont, as there were no other kinds of animals around at this time that would have had an anatomy like this. It was suggested then that Australia during the Cretaceous may have acted as a refuge for late surviving dicynodonts. This wasn't a ridiculous idea, as Cretaceous rocks in Australia had already yielded the last of the Temnospondyls, prehistoric amphibian relatives, with the giant tadpole-like Coolasuchus named in 1997 that was seemingly saved from competition with crocodilians by taking refuge in cold Australian rift valleys. The authors suggested that the isolation of the Australian continent from the rest of the Gondwanan supercontinent enabled a unique Australian fauna to develop during the Mesozoic. 
This would have been a world dominated by dinosaurs filling every large carnivore and herbivore niche, except, apparently, in Australia, where some of the big herbivores of the time were not in fact dinosaurs, but dicynodonts. The paleontologists who described these fossils even proposed that these survivors may have been the Australian equivalents of ceratopsian dinosaurs in Asia and North America, both being robust, big-skulled quadrupeds with beaks and shearing jaws, and that the dicynodonts could have filled this unoccupied niche since ceratopsians were absent in Australia. This late surviving dicynodont idea really was quite extraordinary and had some very interesting implications about what else might be obscured by the incomplete fossil record. However, it turns out that there are some problems with this idea. Another paper published in 2020 pretty conclusively proves that there is no evidence for dicynodonts in the Cretaceous. So then what are these bone fragments really from? Well, by looking through records in the Queensland Museum archives and using trace element analysis, the authors of this 2020 publication managed to show that these fossils could be associated with another fragment in the museum collection that had been collected just five feet away in the same locality, less than a year before the originals were found in 1914. This specimen had not been examined by the authors of the 2003 paper, and what it shows is pretty damning. This bone is quite clearly a part of a maxilla preserving three molars and showing many anatomical characteristics consistent with diprotodontids, a family of marsupials, relatives of koalas and wombats, that lived long after the Cretaceous. The original fragment preserving what they thought was a tusk seems to have actually come from further towards the front of the skull, and the piece of tusk is actually a first upper incisor, while the smaller tooth fragment is probably a second or third incisor. Working out the true age of these specimens was obviously one of the main aims of this study too. However, the technique of dating the sediment associated with the specimen by analysing detrital zircon crystals proved to be inconclusive. But the anatomical evidence does seem to be pretty good in showing that this is definitely not from a dicynodont, and the many diprotodontid features strongly suggest a Cenozoic age. So, the paleontologists conclude, there is still no evidence for dicynodonts living past the end of the Triassic period, and Australia was apparently not a refuge for these synapsids, despite it being a safe harbour for temnospondyl amphibians. It does show, though, how important it is to keep good records of where fossils come from, and how crucial museums are as they store this information for centuries, allowing discoveries like this to be made over 100 years after collections have been donated. So there we have it, a curious story of how interpretations of fragmentary battered fossils can change dramatically when new information is acquired. One moment we had time-travelling relict dicynodonts, and the next we had another diprotodontid. Not that giant prehistoric wombats aren't cool though. It's just important to always have as much context as possible when describing fossils, and maybe not jump to such extraordinary conclusions straight away. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed learning about this story, and thank you again for all the support you've been showing us on our recent Boneheads videos. We've got some great new videos planned for you coming up, so be sure to check them out, especially if you enjoy longer form videos about various paleontological topics and news. Anyway, a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters, Amanda Von Nordek, Archianthus, Clara Middleton, Daniel Ingraham, Drew Shrivastava, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Greg Silvernail, Corey Peterson, Loxy Poo, Mendicant Friar, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nicole Bueno, Persian Boy, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, and Steve Bradshaw. If you'd like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.